Good morning and welcome to First Baptist Church located in Grayton, California. It's a nice cool day out there. Hopefully it will remain that way. We've been having some uh, quite warm weather here. Thankfully we're not inland because it's been quite quite hot in the uh, Sacramento area. Okay, well today is August the 28th, 2022. Give me a second here, I just want to update the prayer list. Okay. Okay, let's go ahead and go uh, to the Lord God in prayer. Most Heavenly Father, God, we just love you and we adore you. Our adoration for you is hopefully seen through our, our words, through our behavior, through the things that we do. Lord, help each one of us to realize that everything that we do, everything that we say, every way that we behave, this includes our body language, Lord. Help us to know that that all reflects how others see us. Help us to remember that we are ambassadors of you, Father. Help us to remember that, Lord, that Everything that we do and say, the way we uh, give off our body language, help us, Heavenly Father, to remember that we are representatives of you. Lord God, we are thankful for all of those that are here in attendance today. Lord, we ask that you be with all of those who were not able to make it here today because of uh, work, or sickness, or whatever other reasons might be out there, Father. Lord, for us to come together and gather in your name and worship you, the fellowship, Lord, is just so wonderful and awesome. And I just wish so many more people would come together. In worship every Sunday and every other day too because we know Lord that we're two or more gathered in your name that you are present that there is love your love Lord Lord God we ask that you uh, as always that you open up our eyes and our ears our hearts help us to hear the words that you would have us to hear today whether it be through the hymns that we sing in worship of you, uh, through the uh, sermon that you've put on God's heart, on uh, Michael's heart, Lord, help us to hear, help us to know what it is, help us to have that discernment that comes only through our personal relationship with you, Father. Lord, as always, we ask all of these things in and through your Son's precious name. Thank you, God. We love you. Amen. Okay, our opening song is number 144, When I Survey the Wonders Cross. I'm keeping in mind as we uh, sing the songs, how uh, the pastor's sermon today is on forgiveness. And one of the things that, the main thing that God did was give us his son, his death on the cross, his sacrifice. So that we may be cleansed, washed of our sins, that we are forgiven. So that we may have that close relationship with God. Hey, okay, number 144.
Christ, my God. All the vain things that charm me most, I sacrifice them to His blood. See from His head, His hands, His feet, sorrow and love, no being rolled down. Did as such love and sorrow be? So amazing, so divine Demands my soul, my life, my all Amen Number 320, turn your eyes upon Jesus Turn your eyes upon Jesus In the light of his glory and grace. 
grace. Amen. And I pray that we're able to go out into the world that's dying and that we tell of his perfect salvation. As we sing the turn your eyes upon Jesus and look full in his wonderful face, I was thinking to myself, you know, how when we're in love with somebody, we take in their whole look, we take in their whole face. And so I like the visualization of that, that we can look into the face of Jesus and know that he loved us so much that he died on the cross for us. It's now time for a tithe and offering, a pastor. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the uh, blessings of people you have here to help us maintain your property, those willing to go out into ministry, those who are called to go out into ministry, and the opportunities that are coming up. We just ask for a special blessing on all those who give, who have been giving, and uh, will be giving. We just praise you. We thank you for all these blessings. In the name of Christ Jesus, amen. Amen. God, number 227. Praise him, praise him. Jesus, our blessed Redeemer. Okay, the uh, pastor's sermon today is on forgiveness. And I did not enter those uh, verses in the bulletin, and so I apologize. Pastor, <laughs> I'm sure that you know what the verses are. <laughs>
Well, I didn't send them to you till late last night, so I'm <laughs> not surprised you don't have them. Okay, well, we're going to talk a little bit about forgiveness. And when you think of forgiveness, what kind of things pop into your mind? Maybe someone you may have harmed that uh, you may want their forgiveness from, or perhaps somebody's harmed you and you need to forgive get them. And be like kind of like the unknown person that did some uh, uh, damage here over the weekend on our property. We need to pray for them, pray they get to know the Christ. And, of course, forgive them for their action. It's nothing that's uh, going to cost us any money. It just takes uh, about 20 minutes to take care of the problem. But think about it. What about something uh, you've done against God? You need forgiveness for that. Maybe you're violating one of the big Ten Commandments. We read about in Exodus, repeated in Deuteronomy. Jesus repeats them. The New Testament actually repeats all of them. Uh, maybe a violation of one of the many other Old Testament commandments. There are more than ten. Maybe a violation of the numerous commandments Jesus gave us. He gave us quite a few. Maybe you're one of those Christians who says they are sinless. They never sin. Have you ever run into one of those? They never sin. They, they never speed on the road. They always use the turn lights. Never get mad. Never have laid judgment on anybody. Just nothing but sweet candy-like talk out of their mouths all the time, never any problem. Well, what does the scripture tell us about sin? What does Paul tell us specifically? Romans 3.23 For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Well, if we all sin, then it sounds like all of us have, a, have some stuff to work on. Who forgives our sins? Well, if you have faith and believe in Christ Jesus, then that's pretty simple. It's him. That solves the whole deal right there. Will God hold sins against you? Not if you believe in Christ. You're forgiven. Do you hold the sins of others against you? Rather, do you hold the other sins towards you uh, that have been done by others? Do you hold them uh, accountable? Or do you not forgive them? And will they, in turn, if you've made any sins against them, will you be forgiving them? Uh, the question is, it's a two-way street. Either we want forgiveness or we need to give forgiveness. And, and so we end up with some questions about what do we do with forgiveness? Well, we learn that there's a lot that we need to study about forgiveness and sin in the scriptures. And there is forgiveness for sin. So it's not etched in granite. So if you open your Bibles to Psalm 32, 5 through 6, we'll be looking at the Old Testament. And we find here that God is always willing to forgive us. Then I acknowledged my sin to you and did not conceal my iniquity. I said, I will confess my transgressions to the Lord, and you took away the guilt of my sin. <coughs> Therefore, let everyone who is faithful pray to you at a time that you may be found. So there is a way for God to forgive us of sins that we're seeing here. Now, this is written by King David. He wrote that psalm. And when a person's conscience is fully awakened, that is, when our conscience fully awakens, we can listen to it, we can hear it. Now, David confesses sin fully, freely, and sincerely. Uh, we actually see this in a situation where he uh, obsessed over somebody's wife, ended up getting her pregnant, and since her husband was in the military, through a series of events he set up with his general Joab, that had him killed in battle, and then he marries, marries his widow. You can kind of start listing the sins there. Of course, thinking that covers up he got her pregnant seems kind of stupid. We figure the kid's going to look like him when he grows up. So it's like, you know, of course, uh, that never happened. The child died shortly after birth. But the thing is, David was involved in a series of sins. Now, the way these verses are uh, worded in the scripture, David could have been making an inward and or an outward confession of his sin. And the thing is, when you read scripture about sin, transgressions, 
Trespasses and equities are all the same thing. So this psalm is actually being accompanied with a painful repentance with sorrow. That is, he's begging for a pardon for his sin to God. Now, if you think about this, isn't this the gospel 800 years earlier? That is, earlier than Jesus being here. And the, and the, the, the apostle John in 1 John says, If we confess our sins, he is faithful and righteous to forgive our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Now, God gave us a prelude to this with his forgiveness of David, King David, uh, when David confessed his sin with Bathsheba to the prophet Nathan. 2 Samuel 12, 13. David responded to Nathan, I have sinned against the Lord. And this is dealing with that situation with Bathsheba. And then Nathan replied to David, the Lord has taken away your sin. David confessed, had remorse, and God removed the sin. The psalm is prophetic in that this is a time when one can, where this is, because it's showing us a time when one can go to God for forgiveness, which we do through Jesus. Now, your faith in Jesus shows you know your sins are you forgiven. That is, if you have faith in Jesus, you know your sins are forgiven through him. Now, numerous times the Apostle Paul will show that our sins are forgiven in Jesus. He does this through virtually all of his letters, and more than once. One example would be Romans 8, verses 1 and 2. Therefore, no condemnation now exists for those in Christ Jesus, because the Spirit's law of life in Christ Jesus has set you free from the law of sin and death. That's probably one of the best ways that he phrases it, as far as I am concerned. But he is showing that through faith in Christ we are forgiven. Now as we move on, we'll go to the New Testament, 1 John chapter 1, verses 8 and 9. We see that we need forgiveness for sin since we all sin. If we say we have no sin, we are deceiving ourselves and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and righteous to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. So we're being told there's a path to forgiveness for our sins. We're being told there's a path here in the New Testament times. Now the Apostle Paul here is combating, amongst other things, Gnostic heresy in these verses and Gnosticism. The body itself, the human body, everything that's matter, is, is, is uh, contaminated and evil and full of, full of sin. But they say the soul is cleansed automatically, which is totally contrary to Scripture. That's one of the problems with Gnosticism. So when someone says without sin, they're only deceiving themselves, as everybody can still see the sin in them. We can see it from their actions, or their behavior, their beliefs, what they do what they're going to say they're going to do, and with social media, it's out there pretty quick. The Gnosticists, as well as the Antimonians, said they were absolved from the moral law. That is, the moral law doesn't apply to us because it's our soul, and that's, that's cleansed. That's heresy. The nature of sin is still in us as we inherit it from Adam and Eve. Just as we inherit all our genetics. So we are depraved. That is, even as Christians, the evil nature still exists in us. And others can see this if we are in denial about it. Now, if you really have trouble believing that, think just without getting into specifics, because you can go back any decade, any year, probably any day of the month, go look at politicians. Over the decades, how many say they're Christians? And they go out and, and, and just blatantly violate God's commandments. They give us an example, a walking example, a living example of sin that still lives in us. Now the Gnostics were unsaved because they saw no need for salvation. Now Christians just say that we don't need a salvation are not being truthful. We need to agree with God what sin is, and confession of sin also means we hate it and strive to stop it. May not be perfect at stopping it, but we strive for it. We have remorse over it. We want to stop it. The believer is eager to remove it from his life. Now, the Holy Spirit reveals sin in a person's life. If you believe in Christ Jesus, you put your faith and belief in him, the Holy Spirit is baptized into you, 
not through the water, not through the baptism, but it's spiritually it's brought right into you, living with you at all times, and will convict you of the sin in your life. And then the two of you together can work on eliminating it. Now there's a difference of sin as a way of life and the occasional slip. Proverbs 28, 13. The one who conceals his sins will not prosper, but whoever confesses and renounces them will find mercy. So this proverb is stating just what John said. We need to confess our sins, renounce them, and change our life. Confessing is agreeing with God on what sin is. It's, it's, it's agreeing with what we need to stop. It's agreeing with them what is proper. Think about it. Can you hide your sin from God? No. It's, you can't hide your sin from God. He knows everything. Our faith in Jesus saves us, gives us forgiveness, but we're still accountable. By accepting your sin and confessing it shows that you're willing to... By accepting that you sin and confessing it shows that you're willing to accept the forgiveness from God. So Romans 3.23, for all sinned and fall short of the glory of God. See, when, when, you, when you accept this verse, you're showing that you need a Savior. Additionally, you need to remember when we have a calling from God to be of use from Him. He has a use for every one of us. It may be praying, it may be financially supporting ministries, churches, it may, it may be going out on mission. We all have different callings. It might, might be uh, doing work around the building as a servant. In a small church, that's pretty much almost everybody. But the thing is, we have we have a calling to be of use to him. Hence, we need to work on removing our sin. And there's a reason for it. Uh, Peter tells us in uh, 2 Peter 5 through 8. For this very reason, make every effort to supplement your faith with goodness, goodness with knowledge, Knowledge with self-control, self-control with endurance, endurance with godliness, godliness with brotherly affection, brotherly affection with love. For if these qualities are yours and are increasing, they will keep you from being useless or unfruitful in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. So we need to work on things to be of use to God. And then finally, God will forgive us if we forgive others. Matthew, chapter 6, verses 14 and 15. For if you forgive people the wrongdoings, your heavenly Father will forgive you as well. But if you don't forgive people, your Father will not forgive your wrongdoing. So when we look at it, forgiveness is a two-way street. It's not one way, it's two-way. It's, it's compassion. Compassion is a two-way street. You cannot expect God to forgive your sins if you don't forgive sins of others that are done against you. This actually is part of the Lord's Prayer. What we call the Lord's Prayer, Matthew 5, 12, Jesus speaking about how we are to pray to God. And forgive us our debts as we have forgiven our debtors. So in that prayer, we're actually asking God not to forgive us unless we have forgiven others. Or in the same way we forgive others, he forgives us, which includes not forgiving them. A lot of people don't realize what they're praying for when they do that prayer. So in that prayer, again, we are asking God to uh, not to forgive unless we have forgiven others. Now you show obedience to Jesus by forgiving others. Now there's lots and lots of scripture about that. We'll just look real quickly at just uh, three or four here. Uh, in a conversation between Jesus and Peter, Peter wanted to know how many times he used to forgive somebody. It's almost as though he's saying, what point? Can I not forgive them and bear a grudge? It's almost, almost like that. How how much how much um, forgiveness do I have to give? You know, but the answer Jesus gives is one that basically shows no limit. Verses eight, uh, chapter eighteen, verses twenty one through twenty two. Then Peter came to him and said, Lord, how many times can my brother sin against me and I forgive him? As many as seven times. I tell you, not as many as seven, Jesus said to him, but 70 times seven. So you know Peter's not running around with a slate, keeping track of how far along we are towards 491, so we can now stop forgiving. 
is basically saying it's beyond our ability to remember how many times a person has sinned against us. We are to forgive them. In other words, there's no limit. Jesus tells a parable about where a servant is cruel to those who are unable to repay a debt. And he gives us a warning about forgiveness in this. That his forgiveness is to be sincere. Now this, this servant was forgiven by somebody else. And who is kind to him, and he in turn, that is this, this forgiven servant, is being cruel to those that uh, cannot pay him back a debt. So this, this warning is showing us that we need to, to be sincere in forgiveness. Matthew 18, verse 35, and here is the warning. So my heavenly Father will also do to you if each of you does not forgive his brother from his heart. So... We are to forgive people through our heart. We're to be sincere about it. And there's a warning to us about just not forgiving people. In Mark 11.25, Jesus not only instructs but warns us that we need to forgive anyone we find issues with in order to find a forgiveness from God. So again, we're being told we need to forgive others in order for God to forgive us. And this is not about salvation. We're saved with our faith and belief in Christ. But there is some accountability. The Apostle Paul gives us a list of demands on how we're to act as Christians. More importantly, these instructions become a witness to the unbelieving world. That is, how we act is how other people will see God. Because the closest many come to a Bible is what we say and do. We are witnessing to an unbelieving world with our actions. Colossians chapter 3, verses 12 through 13. Therefore, God's chosen ones, holy and loved, but on heartfelt compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience, accepting one another and forgiving one another if anyone has a complaint against another. Just as the Lord has forgiven you, so you must also forgive. Now, we get lots of examples of forgiveness in Scripture. Romans 5.8 calls us another one, uh, showing us another path of forgiveness uh, that uh, was one established before we even knew Jesus. And that is, God showed his love for us by giving us a path for forgiveness before we even believed or knew him. Romans 5.8 but God proves his own love for us and that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. So what we see here, God is always willing to forgive us. We need forgiveness for sin since we all sin. And God will forgive us if we forgive others. So God has given us the ultimate forgiveness by adopting us into his family if we're believers in Christ. And as such, we spend eternity in his kingdom. My challenge for you is to just to consciously be more forgiving of other people who fall short of your expectations. I was once told that an unrealistic expectation is a premeditated resentment. So let's work on forgiving others. Now, if you've not prayed for the Holy Spirit to come into you, not specifically except for Christ as Lord and Savior, do so right now. Don't waste any time on this. May God bless you and have a great week. Thank you, Pastor Michael. As you were uh, delivering your, your sermon on forgiveness, I kept on thinking about two times in my life where forgiveness came natural as a new believer and then as a more mature believer. I was living in uh, Las Vegas, Nevada, uh, 2001. And it was actually just about the time of... Um, 9-11, I think it was actually uh, the end of September that year, and I had left the house with my kid brother, and we went to run an errand, and then when we came back, I realized that something wasn't right in the house, and I went into my room, and somebody had broken the window there, come into the house, they stole all of my um, rings, I used to have gold rings on all my fingers, and... It just broke my heart because one of them was my high school ring and uh, several rings that were custom made for me when I lived in Texas and my heart was just broken. And then I went into my parents' room and they had broken into my mom's 
armoire, which was all drawers of jewelry. And um, it just just broke my heart. And they took my um, my dad's uh, 357 from underneath the bed. And I was just so angry and so mad that they had violated us, you know, by coming in and doing that. And of course, we called the police. And then by nighttime, when I lay down in the same room that they broke into, uh, you know, I had uh, boarded it up, I think, with cardboard or something. And as I lay down and was talking to God about the whole thing, I actually envisioned the people. I don't know who they were, but they looked like, in my mind's eye, they looked like you know, teenage boys. I saw them climbing in through the window. Again, this was in my mind's eye. And I started to cry that they were in such a position, either for the need of money, for whatever, um, or just were so full of sin that they, you know, felt the need to, you know, first break into the yard, uh, the backyard, which was, you know, high, high fences and stuff, and then break in, actually break a window, come in and, you know, and steal stuff that, you know, was just valuable to people. And then, you know, to go into other parts of the house and steal more stuff. I had renter's insurance, so you know, that wasn't the problem, though. I couldn't replace anything that they had stolen of me, the mine or my mom's. So we did replace the revolver, you know, for my dad. Uh, but it just, my heart went out to them. At first I was mad at them, but then... My heart went out to them that they were even in that position. So I, that, that's when I forgave them. And every once in a while, I'm reminded of that, just like when somebody gives a sermon on, on uh, forgiveness. And then I had one other time as a uh, more mature believer. I had somebody who I respected very much um, say that I did a, a certain thing. I won't deal with the uh, details on that and it, it, it broke my heart again that they you know they were in Christ and that they put these false charges against me every time I see them even to this day and we're talking it's been about 10 years my heart breaks and I get mad at them for doing that but I forgave them uh, but I have a hard time forgetting and God tells us, you know, that, that he, for, he forgives and he forgets our sins. And so I have to remind myself that we are not God. We can forgive, but it's hard to forget. So every time I do think of that instance, uh, it, you know, just my heart's breaking right now thinking about me. Uh, I forgive that person. You know, I just forgive them again in my heart. Uh, knowing that, you know, that God forgave me, and so I must forgive. So I'm sure that each one of you have things in your life where somebody has hurt you or harmed you in some way, and you maybe have forgiven them, but never forgotten it. And so what helps me is every time I think about it, I lift them up to the Lord again and, and forgive them for the hurt. Uh, that they imposed upon me. Okay, thank you for listening. Um, so we have uh, announcements. We just recently had a new sewer line installed. Uh, so I'm thankful that we could afford that and thankful for uh, it happening. If you have access to any small rocks or gravel uh, that you would like to uh, donate to the church, we need it for our... Uh, you know, we're, we're going through a lot of the areas of the church and the landscaping, and we're trying to uh, redo it by putting gravel and make it more efficient so that we don't have to maintain, we don't have to take, spend as much time uh, maintaining, mowing, and things like that. So just if you do have uh, a bunch of gravel laying around that you don't want, or if you know anybody that's willing to bring it to us, that would be wonderful. Um, just let the pastor or myself know. Um, let's see. Uh, prayers and praises. Uh, continue to pray for Don. He's in hospice in his uh, 
that he heals. Just because somebody's in hospice doesn't necessarily mean they have to die. I know people that have been in hospice that ended up not dying for quite a while, and they were able to come out of hospice. So, and also for his wife, Sharon. I'll continue to pray for for Kitty for your um, continued uh, healing on your wrist and on your knee. And I was thinking about your your grandchild in Denver. Two grandchildren in, in Denver. So I was praying for them the other day. So let's, they're just resettling after uh, a huge fire there. Uh, also, continue to pray for Laura Lee, which is uh, Michael's mom. And she's in her uh, early 90s and I'm having some health issues. Uh, there's a, a gentleman by the name of um, Bill McDowell who a lot of uh, folks here know him. He's from another church in Santa Rosa. Anyways, he's uh, left the hospital, and he's uh, the doctors have only given him weeks. And again, my thinking is, you know, he can be healed. It's a possibility. So let's not just say somebody's going to die. Let's have hope in God and, and always pray God's will rather than what we want. Um, I have a dear friend, Marguerite. She's a centurion. She's been with us since about, she's been alive for 102 years. Um, I first met her in the 1990s when I was a new Christian. And um, she is a pianist and just a lover of the Lord very much. She's been a church organist and pianist forever. Now, the first time that I, that I spent some time with her, she used to live up in Vallejo. She's now in Atlanta with her daughter, uh, which is a different of mine, Ruth. Anyways, the first time I ever spent any time with her, um, I was just kind of whistling because I'm a whistler. And she started whistling, and she harmonized with me with the whistling, which was pretty cool. And uh, so she asked me, she said, would you come, when you come to church this Sunday, um, would you uh, whistle with me for the church? And I will harmonize with you. And I said, sure. So I've never done that before or after. Uh, but she asked me one day, she said, Charlene, how can I how can I stay in God's word? You know, reading God's word. She said every time she said she sits down to read God's word, she starts to fall asleep. And I smiled and I said, Well, you can put it on audio and listen to it that way, but it's okay if you fall asleep when you're reading God's Word, because God's Word is very relaxing and very healing. Um, and I've always remembered that. I watched a video of her the other day, and um, her grandchildren were with her, and she was trying to tell them about the trees outside that made such a beautiful noise when the wind blew, but they weren't hearing her, and that, that kind of broke my heart. So I pray that the children the grandchildren and the children will stop and listen to their their mother and their grandmother. I mean, she's been around for 102 years. She's loved the Lord a good part of that. And she has a lot to teach us. I'll be in prayer for my dear friend, Julie Dean. She lives in uh, Osage City right now. And uh, she's just down with COVID and it's really bad. Uh, she just recently uh, recovered from uh, cancer. Also, let's be with Roberto. He's one of our neighbors. Uh, let's keep him in prayer. Let's pray that he comes to know the Lord Jesus Christ as his Lord and Savior. So if you ever have any prayers, uh, prayer requests that, or praises that you would like to share, just let us know. Perhaps put them in the uh uh, what's it called? The uh, offertory plate? Or perhaps uh, somebody suggested that we put up a little box for prayer requests if you want them to be anonymous or if you don't want them to be anonymous. Okay, let's go ahead and go to the hymnal and we'll do our closing hymn. Oh, uh, one quick other prayer is continue to pray for uh, Doug and uh, Doug's mobility. He seems to be moving a lot better, but he still would probably like to move even better.
Okay, number 411. Tis so sweet to trust in Jesus. So I trust everybody has a wonderful, uh, beautiful, uh, wonderful week. Take care. God bless you guys. See you later, Katie.